If, if I might just say quickly, this is, uh, it's truly fantastic to see all of you here to, to share this really wonderful occasion. Um, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, Father Hesburgh, and, and everybody here. My name is Jim McAdams, and I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies here at Notre Dame. And I'd like to welcome you on the occasion of the second annual Terence R. Keeley Visiting Vatican Lecture. Terry Keeley is a, a great friend of ours, a great friend of uh, Notre Dame. He graduated from this university in 1981 in history, which I guess proves that even history majors get jobs. Uh, and he was, <laughs> he was the first junior uh, member of the Notre Dame Board of Trustees. Uh, much more importantly, he's a board member of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies, which sponsors this lecture series. Over the past several years, the United States and its European allies have made a startling discovery. After the passing of a generation of Atlantis' policymakers and intellectuals, they do not necessarily know each other. They find themselves increasingly prone to misunderstanding, and in the case of this particular transatlantic relationship, there are at times uh, some tensions and some anxieties between both sides. The Catholic universities of the U.S. have their own special relationship with a particular European institution, the Holy See, which, although far less prone to conflict than the Atlanticist relationship, is equally complex. We Catholics like to think that we know the Vatican, but sometimes when our knowledge is filtered through the wisdom of the local parish and such venerable sources of enlightenment as the New York Times, and Fox News, <laughs> there is occasionally room for misunderstanding and even misinformation. Likewise, Vatican authorities get a different picture of American Catholic universities than we would sometimes like to convey to them. They, knew us, they know us, but in the case of Notre Dame in particular, it's interesting what they know about us. Tonight we have the distinct pleasure of listening to someone who can provide us with a unique perspective on how the Vatican views the Catholic universities of both Europe and the United States. As someone who has taught in a Catholic university in the US, our guest is capable of providing a nuanced assessment of these two bilateral relationships. But our speaker also has a greater claim to truth and objectivity. He is from Canada. <laughs> that other America to our north, where, like all of his compatriots, he has been able to observe the behavior of the United States with curiosity, occasional bewilderment, and always good humor. Archbishop Michael Miller studied at the Gregorian University in Rome, where he completed his doctorate in theology. He was ordained to the priesthood by Pope Paul VI on June 29, 1975, and he is also a member of the Congregation of Priests of St. Basil. Archbishop Miller joined the faculty of the University of St. Thomas in Houston in 1979, where he subsequently rose to become chair of the Department of Theology, then dean of the School of Theology, and finally in 1997, the university's seventh president. In January 2004, Archbishop Miller was ordained as titular Archbishop of Vertara, and was assigned as the Secretary of the Congregation for Catholic Education in the Holy See. In this capacity, his authority extends over three areas of Catholic education. First, all seminaries and houses of formation. Secondly, all schools depending on ecclesial authorities. And most important for tonight, all universities, faculties, institutes, and higher schools of study. We are delighted that you're with us, Archbishop Miller, and we look forward to listening to your lecture entitled Reflections, the Vatican's Relations with the Catholic Universities of Europe and the United States.
Very kind, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McAdams, for your kind invitation. Uh, Bishop Darcy, uh, Father Hesburgh in a, in a special way, and all friends and colleagues. It's really a thrill to be here at the University of Notre Dame. It's surprising that after hearing about praying uh, so much for Notre Dame over the years that I finally made it to the campus to see the Golden Dome only to discover that it isn't the dome on the Basilica. <laughs> An, an, an egregious error. Uh, uh, Father Jenkins took me uh, to the grotto to pray. We were there at noon, able to say uh, the Angelus together. It's really, it's just uh, uh, wonderful to, uh, to be uh, in your midst. I'd particularly like to congratulate Father Jenkins, who's not here. I, I did, as I mentioned, uh, see him earlier uh, on his uh, inauguration as president, especially for the uh, very reassuring words that he issued, warming uh, many a Roman heart, that in his vision of Notre Dame, he saw it as a university that combines the highest level of disciplinary expertise with the resources of its moral and religious tradition, resources that we know to be both rich and profound. Indeed, Notre Dame is committed to fulfilling its mission, the same mission entrusted to all institutions of higher learning, of being a primary, indeed a privileged place for a fruitful dialogue between the gospel and culture. Uh, I was given fair latitude in, in the choice of topic for which I am extremely grateful. I've sort of dealt with uh, three different versions of it. What it comes down to, though, are really some reflections on the challenges facing American and European Catholic universities, particularly from my current position as Secretary of the Congregation for Catholic uh, Education. Uh, I'll address these challenges um, in light of what are the known positions of the Holy See, uh, articulated, of course, in uh, its documents. There'll be many sort of references, direct or in, indirect, especially to Ex Cordia Ecclesiae, but also to the interventions of Pope John Paul II and also of the current Holy Father when he wrote as Cardinal uh, Ratzinger. First of all, what do we mean by the Vatican, a view from the Vatican? Uh, you know, dear one person, uh, speak on behalf of the Vatican, and of course the answer to that is no, one person cannot speak on behalf of, of the Vatican. Uh, I can speak sort of from my position, knowing what the sort of the lay of, of the land is. But the Vatican, at least for uh, our attention this evening, in the world of higher education, uh, is really the Congregation for Catholic Education which is the instrument used by the Pope to express his concern in the sphere of education throughout the universal church. To dis discharge his responsibility in this regard, he mandates the Roman Curia, specifically the Congregation for Catholic Education, both to act in his name and with his authority. The origins of the congregation go back to special papal commissions created in the mid-15th century for maintaining vigilance over the universities in Rome and in the papal states. There was already a, a tie with the Vatican, but it wasn't exercised through a, a special commission. And then in 1588, after the Council of Trent, Pope Sixtus V reorganized the uh, Curia, and established under its current name the Congregation for Catholic Education. Its duties were to supervise ecclesiastical studies in Rome and in certain other Catholic universities which remained Catholic after the reform. At the beginning of this century, 
the Congregation for Catholic Education assumed oversight over seminaries, the seminary, uh, the formation of seminarians both academically throughout the world and uh, in terms of their formation for the Latin Church. In 1967, Paul VI also gave us the responsibility to oversee Catholic uh, schools, primary and secondary schools. What we have then are 3,500 seminaries under our jurisdiction, 1,500 institutions of higher learning, and 50 million students in Catholic schools around the world. I'm going to spend most of the time, of course, on the area that concerns us on institutions of, of higher learning. Within those institutions of higher learning, approximately 250 are, and this is important to get hold of, are called ecclesiastical universities or faculties. These are institutions which grant their degree in the name of the Roman pontiff, what we call pontifical degrees or canonical degrees. And they are governed by an apostolic constitution called Sapientia Christiana, issued in 1979. For example, the Catholic University of America in Washington has a faculty of canon law, a faculty of theology, and a faculty of philosophy, all of which are governed by the norms of the 1979 Apostolic Constitution. There are only seven such places in the United States of America, but there are 250 in the world. We're not going to be referring to most of them. We're going to be talking about the 1,300 Catholic institutions of higher learning. It's a fair number. 220 of these are in the United States. One of them, or two of them, are in South Bend. Only 30, however, are found in Europe. There are eight Catholic universities in Spain, five in France, three in Italy, and two in Belgium and the Netherlands. The relative scarcity of European Catholic universities, however, must be counterbalanced by the significant number of ecclesiastical faculties, especially of theology, which are attached in many countries to state uh, universities. Think Germany. One Catholic university for a population of approximately 35 million Catholics at Eichstätt, yet it has 26 faculties of theology. Poland, one Catholic university at Lublin, but 14 faculties of theology, nine of which have been founded in the last 20 years. Since 1990, the number of Catholic institutions of higher learning, what we call colleges or universities, has grown steadily. There have been 160 new foundations in the last 15 years. 10 in Africa, a whopping 108 in Asia, including 99 in India. There have been two in Canada, five in the United States, but nine in Mexico. In the same period, Europe has seen uh, seven new uh, Catholic universities founded, four of them in Spain, one in Hungary, one in Italy, and one in Slovakia. And I believe that the uh, uh, Institute has uh, relations with the ones founded in Eastern Europe. Most universities in this country were founded by religious, communi uh, religious communities, the Holy Cross Fathers, the Jesuits, and so on. This is not true in Europe, and certainly it's not true for the new foundations. Another enormous difference between America and Europe are the arrangements in financing. In Europe, even Catholic universities are given primarily, uh, are funded primarily from the state in varying degrees. Uh, full support, for example, in the Netherlands and Belgium. Minimal support, however, in Italy and in France. In France, too, uh, Catholic universities cannot be called universities, they are institutes. The, the, the government for, forbids them to use the term uh, university and they don't in fact even really grant their degrees. Their degrees are granted 
through uh, the umbrella of a state uh, institution. All in all, Catholic higher education in the United States is singly the strongest uh, system that there is uh, in the world. No country comes near to matching the strength of tertiary institutions in a single nation or for the number of Catholics. It's just a, a little bit of history for the Holy, Holy See's concern. The Holy See, of course, has been concerned for higher education, in the area of higher education, for centuries. All of the great European universities, from Oxford to Paris to Cologne to Prague to Bologna, were established with very close ties to the church. As institutions where the liberal arts were studied, they prepared students for service to society and the church, especially in the areas of theology, law, and medicine, the foundational professions of emerging medieval society. Their animating force was what? Love for truth and love for learning. Despite the common Enlightenment interpretation that these universities were corporations founded by the laity to uh, obviate or to, or to um, get out from under ecclesiastical authority, this in fact is not accurate. The universities were founded uh, with these links to the church, especially to the Holy See, whose protection they sought to protect them from the encroachment of civil and in some cases of Episcopal authority. And at the origin of nearly every university, there is a papal bull which either authorizes or confirms its foundation. That's why John Paul II in, could begin his apostolic exhortation affirming that universities in the West are born or were born from the heart of the church. It's worthwhile here to point out that one of the recent popes, major innovations in the field of higher education was precisely to relate the Holy See, the Vatican, to relate the Vatican by means of legislation not just to ecclesiastical universities and faculties, where theology, canon law, philosophy, in some instances sacred music, archaeology, or medieval studies are taught, but all Catholic colleges and universities. In some measure, at least, this happened because of American input. In March 1982, the Pope received several presidents of American Catholic universities, including Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame and Sister Alice uh, Gallen of Trinity in Washington. And they pressed to have all Catholic colleges and universities, even those that were not founded by the Holy See, they pressed that they be included in the new code of canon law, which at that time was in the final stages of being uh, final, uh, drawn up. Their meeting with the Holy Father bore fruit since in 1983, the code of canon law included within its legislation canons applicable to universities and colleges that were not ecclesiastical, but Catholic. This had not been true in the 1917 code, and until this point, there was no universal legislation directed at Catholic colleges and universities. For the first time, then, virtually all Catholic institutions of higher education were embraced by the Holy See and subject to its legislation. This was confirmed in an extraordinarily forceful way by the promulgation of the Apostolic Constitution, Ex Corde Ecclesiae, 
on the Feast of the Assumption 1990. Prior to that, the apostolic constitution that governed uh, ecclesiastical faculties only and, and ecclesiastical universities was Sapientia Christiana. And this apostolic constitution, and this is, is, was very novel, secured the right of the Holy See through the Congregation for Catholic Education to intervene when necessary in any Catholic university. It would, of course, normally do this through the uh, competent uh, ecclesiastical authority, namely the bishop of the place. This also, another uh, inf very important novelty of the apostolic constitution ex cordi ecclesiae, which John Paul called the Magna Carta of contemporary Catholic higher education, was that it secured the universities the university's relationship to the church's mission of evangelization. That the university was to be seen as sharing in the mission of evangelization. I think this, uh, the significance of this has in many cases been overlooked because of undue attention paid to, paid to the mandatum. But in fact, what is, which, which is, that which is far more significant is this passage. By its very nature, each Catholic university makes an important contribution to the church's work of evangelization. Moreover, all the basic, academics, all the basic academic activities of a Catholic university are connected with and in harmony with the evangelizing mission of the church. While maintaining all the autonomy proper to its nature, every Catholic university is called to be, to play a particular role at the very center of ecclesial life. The main question really is, what are the challenges that face universities in the United States and in Europe in meeting the expectation that they be instruments of the church's mission of evangelization? How do they do this? Have they done it? What does the future look like? I'll draw primarily on the teachings of Pope John Paul II because his pontificate was so fruitful in this regard. But I'd also like to draw upon the, the writings of Cardinal Ratzinger and a few things that give us uh, an insight into uh, the direction, I think, that the current pope might take us, what he thinks about institutions. Not surprisingly of primary concern to the Vatican in all its interventions in the sphere of education. What it comes back and talks about again and again is preserving and fostering the specifically Catholic identity of the university as such. What makes an institution of higher learning Catholic? They are concerned with the question, what's the difference between Notre Dame and Yale, between Georgetown and Harvard, or between St. Mary's and Haverford? This is a new question. In the conciliar document, Gravissimum Educationis, which was the decree on Christian education issued exactly 40 years ago, 40 years and three days ago on the 28th of October. In the section on higher education, nothing is said about the importance of fostering, preserving, maintaining the Catholic identity of institutions. It was only in light of the upheavals of 1968 that the Holy See began to identify this challenge and seek ways to meet it. 
these also for Joseph Ratzinger had a certain real importance, the events of 68 in his pro life as a, as a university professor. Indeed, the complaint has sometimes been lodged that on this long journey toward a definition of a Catholic university, the questions from the Vatican side always seem to deal with, cath with the Catholicity of the institution without previous discussion of the nature of a university which is trying to be Catholic. A little bit of carping. Not, however, too far off the mark on noting that it is precisely the Catholic part of Catholic University that concerns, in a, in a particular way, the Holy See. Not that it doesn't understand that it's also dealing with a university, but the contribution that it makes, the, the area of, of its concern, is uh, the, Catholic, uh, the, 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 the Catholic character of the institution. And according to Ex Cordia Ecclesiae, an institution of higher learning, precisely as Catholic, must have a clear ecclesial identity which is publicly manifest in showing certain essential characteristics certain marks, if you will. The Holy See's primary concern, then, is encouraging and fostering, and if necessary, the reclaiming of the Catholic identity of ecclesial institutions of higher learning. This identity is, can be summed up in two, there's sort of two primary uh, sort of areas which spell out how the Vatican is concerned. The first is it insists on the university's institutional commitment uh, to the church. And secondly, its fidelity to Catholic teaching. I'd like to take up each of these in terms. First, according to John Paul II, the purpose of a Catholic university is precisely to ensure in an institutional manner, we're talking about an institution, it's to ensure in an institutional manner the Christian uh, presence in the world of higher education. In other words, the institution, such as Notre Dame or a St. Mary's or a Mercyhurst, should manifest a Christian inspiration, not just in the single individuals who make up the body, but of the university community as such. The Pope means that a Catholic center of higher learning is much more than a collection of individuals who are animated by their faith and are working for the renewal, in this instance, of, the, of intellectual life. Many, probably most Catholic scholars in the world, fulfill their vocations precisely in this way, as individuals or perhaps joined in associations, could be Opus Dei or Comunione Liberazione. But they work in institutions as individuals. They do not bear collective or corporate witness. However, a Catholic university is made up of a community which must give corporate and collective witness to the, uh, to the Catholic faith. Catholic universities have a distinct ethos, a conscience which stands for something even when it is betrayed by individuals in the institution. It is larger than the sum of the, the parts. In other words, in a Catholic university, the people involved are more than, they're more than just like-minded folks who operate with a civil charter to provide higher education. They are structured expressions of the church's mission. And they are therefore publicly recognized institutions whose basic activities are connected with and in harmony with the evangelizing mission of the church. In much of the discussion, both before and after uh, ex corde, um, the, 
there was a certain amount of concern expressed that the new document, with its accompanying legislation, the second part of Ex Corte Ecclesia has very specific norms that are to be implemented. Um, the first part is widely praised and lauded and read. The second part is often uh, ignored. But a lot of uh, commentators suggested that the institutional autonomy of Catholic universities required that the Pope and the bishop should really sit on the sidelines. You know, they wear baseball caps at, 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 at appropriate times and they wear zucchettos at appropriate times, but they are, uh, that the Catholic university has no juridical bond with the church. This is simply not the understanding of ex cordia ecclesiae. It is not the understanding of the current code of canon law. And the famous phrase of John Paul II, which he uh, said at Xavier University in New Orleans, that the bishop is not an external agent, uh, is one that is constantly repeated in the Holy See's documentation and in countless exhortations to bishops and in the new directory for the pastoral ministry of bishops, that the juridical bond of the church is interior to a Catholic university and it is not an external uh, imposition and that it is the bond is manifest in terms of the relationship with the local ordinary. Now, I'd like to say something about the institutional identity of a Catholic university in light of what we might be able to put together by looking at the writings of Joseph Ratzinger to see what might lie ahead of us. This is pure speculation, uh, but it's a chance for me, and this was a chance for me to, to read and reread some of Cardinal Ratzinger's writings and, and try to say, what is this going to mean for the Congregation of Catholic Education? What is this going to mean for Catholic universities? Can we uh, tell from what he thinks about institutions what might lie ahead of us? On several occasions, Cardinal Ratzinger, and I'll refer to him to the Pope as Ratzinger when he was Ratzinger, he still is Ratzinger, but uh, <laughs> for purposes uh, uh, of making the uh, distinction. Cardinal Ratzinger s s expressed his views on Catholic institutions in general on numerous occasions. What does he think about the sort of the structures that surround Catholic life? Structures of schooling, structures of healthcare, structures of social service agencies, bureaucracies. He has argued, for example, or he argued, that it might be better for the church not to expend her resources trying to preserve institutions, whether universities, hospitals, or social service agencies, if their Catholic identity has been seriously compromised. In response to Peter Sewald's observation that the church, Sewald said, seems fixated on securing her own hereditary fiefs, Ratzinger replied, once the church has acquired some good or position, an institution, she inclines to defend it. The capacity for self-moderation and self-pruning is not adequ adequately developed, especially where we have far more church institutions than we can imbue with an ecclesial spirit. And it's precisely the fact that the church clings to the institutional structure when nothing really stands behind it any longer that brings the church into disrepute. While Pope John Paul counted on the renewal of Catholic universities to assist the church in the work of the new evangelization, at least one of his close associates thought that some of those same institutions might be an obstacle to her mission if the people within them lacked the inner conviction about their authentic ecclesial nature. To date, Pope Benedict XVI, the former philosophy 
professor at Münster, uh, Tübingen, Munich, Bonn, has not said very much at all about Catholic institutions of higher learning. John Allen, the sometimes astute American Vatican uh, Vaticanologist, offers, however, an insight into his thought in his new book. And I think in this he's fairly, um, I think he's very accurate, but you judge. He says this, this is Allen, in the rise of Benedict XVI. The new pope has on many occasions made the argument that it is a mistake for the Catholic Church to attempt to preserve a sprawling network of institutions if those institutions are no longer motivated by a strong sense of Catholic identity. Well, he just lifted that out of the, the, interview, the interview with Seewald. Quality, not quantity, will be this pope's watchword. Now he makes an application that the pope doesn't make. Better to have one college that does this convincingly from Benedict's point of view than ten that are muddles and compromised, bringing the church into disrepute. The new pope's conviction is that sometimes the best thing the church can do under such a set of circumstances is to let an institution go, recognizing that once its vital link with the faith is severed, clinging to it merely fosters the impression that the church is interested in preserving institutions for their own sake. Under some circumstances, Ratzinger has argued, it's better to become smaller and less socially significant in order to remain faithful. I, I believe that Alan might well be onto something. We're all in the realm of speculation. But there is enough of a trail in Cardinal Ratzinger's writings to suggest, as he did elsewhere, that a time of purification lies ahead. And this undoubtedly will have some ramifications on the church's educational institutions. Indeed, he affirmed, he wrote, this is Cardinal Ratzinger, it seems certain to me that very hard times await the church. Her own crisis has as yet hardly begun. That statement dates from many years ago, but it's not too different from his meditation offered at the Via Crucis this year at the Colosseum, when he referred to the church, as a direct quote, as a boat about to sink, a boat taking in water from every side. This two weeks, two and a half weeks before his election. For Benedict, I would venture, the measure of an institution's Catholic identity can be judged by the integrity of its gospel witness. This means that where the secularization in a university appears to be irrevocably entrenched, then it might well be a matter of truthfulness and justice to declare that such an institution is no longer officially Catholic. I bring this to your attention for one main reason. In recent years, the debate in the United States and to a lesser degree in Europe, the debate over the Catholic identity of universities has presumed that the church herself, or the Vatican, wants to, has presumed that the church herself wants to preserve all her institutions of higher education. That she has, if you will, a vested interest simply in their continuance. But what if that presumption is mistaken. The views once expressed by our new Pope suggest that it might be. He and perhaps other bishops may believe that if a nominally Catholic university is no longer motivated by a strong sense of its institutional Catholic identity, it is better to let it go, to end its claim of being Catholic. Perhaps the debate over the Catholic identity of institutions of higher education can now move to a different level. Instead of the sterile arguments 
over how Catholic light a university can be and still be Catholic, the question becomes, how does a Catholic university honestly and effectively provide a Christian presence in the world of higher education? The burden of proof falls on the university itself. The challenge thus becomes whether a Catholic university can develop the institutional arrangements that clearly demonstrate its willingness to participate in the church's evangelizing mission as well as be of service to the world. This way of phrasing the question assumes, of course, that an institution itself actually wants to remain, or to retain, rather, its Catholic identity. Is that always true? No doubt, some might well opt for letting it go, as has already happened even in this country in a few instances. It strikes me that it is important for all the so-called stakeholders of a Catholic university to face this fundamental option, to face it honestly, and for them to decide the institution's future direction. Let me also stress that such a decision to retain one's Catholic identity cannot simply be equated with maintaining the status quo. Instead, it involves positive institutional changes which will result in clear witness where this has not been the case in teaching and scholarship, clear witness to Catholicism's rich intellectual, artistic, moral, literary, historical, spiritual, social, political, and even scientific traditions. Catholicism, as we know, is a living, indeed it's a lively tradition. It's a tradition that is constantly challenged and refreshed by its own saints, its own sinners, its artisans, its rogues, its pilgrims, its sufferers. This is our tradition. Just to, I think, to suggest that I'm not just fanciful here, I'd like to read something that John Paul, this, a very important statement of John Paul II that he made in, 19, uh, in 2002 to the International Congress on Globalization. And during the time when he was when he made this statement, the Belgian bishops were in Rome. And Belgium, of course, is home uh, to uh, both Leuven and Louvain, which in the Catholic uh, context of Europe uh, have presented certain problems, particularly about research done in their uh, faculty of medicine. And the Holy Father, without, of course, referring to anybody by name, nonetheless, at this, uh, on this occasion said, it is clear that university centers that do not observe the law of the church and the teaching of the magisterium, especially in the matter of bioethics, cannot be considered as having the character of a Catholic university. Whether or not the Holy See should in any way force the question is certainly very moot and delicate. Despite some publicity to the contrary, in general, it is always very reluctant to do so. The stakes, of course, are very high. And in an institution which thinks in centuries, a premium is placed on prudence. Some would say the premium placed is too high. While some argue for the way of evangelical pruning of institutions, others are just as convinced especially in Europe, where many Catholic universities have centuries-old traditions, these are convinced that while a particular university's ecclesial identity might well be compromised in the moment, and they can point to evidences that would probably provoke widespread agreement, it is still better for them that we be patient because they see the institution as only temporarily 
sort of being held hostage by a generation that given time will pass. The better course of action they maintain is be patient, work for slow incremental changes while putting up with what is far less than the ideal and pray that successive generations will reassert the institution's Catholic identity for the sake of their children's children. Whether we will embark on evangelical pruning or whether we will con continue sort of to patiently await conversion is of course an open question. Nonetheless, it seems to me that reading some of the material of Cardinal Ratzinger, that he appears to be more inclined to um, the avoidance of what many would regard as scandal and to leave the path of evangelical pruning uh, open. We don't know. We await. I'd like to close with uh, one last uh, point, uh, and this is to recall the Holy See's profound interest in international educational solidarity at the in the in at the highest levels of uh, collaboration among institutions of higher learning around the world, as well as Catholic identity questions of, of Catholic fidelity. There is, I think, uh, in recent years, evidence in magisterial documents and in statements from the popes of a particular concern about the widening gap of inequality that manifests itself in social, economic, cultural, and technological spheres, but also in the area of educational opportunities, especially in the area of uh, education at the tertiary level. That this gap is very frequently called uh, an injustice and so on. Therefore, essential to an, institution, an institution's genuine Catholicity is the special role it attributes to the promotion of social justice to the gospel's option of preference for the poor. But this is integral to Catholic identity. Indeed, speaking for a worldwide community, more than half of whose members are poor, the Vatican is well aware of the call to serve the marginalized, the underprivileged, and vulnerable members of society and seeks to convince those on the wealthier side of the great divide to be attentive to the cry of the poor in the area of education. The unevenness of the resources available to Catholic higher, educations, higher, uh, to Catholic higher education institutions worldwide is a serious matter that needs to be dealt with. Many in Europe and the United States enjoy abundant resources to meet certainly the demands of teaching and serious research in a technological age. This is not, however, the case for most Catholic institutions of higher learning throughout the world. And in a recent statement signed on, jointly signed by the Congregation for Catholic Education and the International Federation of Catholic Universities, they wrote the following. It is this asymmetry that calls for cooperation among Catholic institutions worldwide. In, in the light of the mission of the university to serve, this educational divide can be an opportunity and an avenue where this mandate for service can be realized. The challenge is to rectify this asymmetry by cooperative efforts. How does the Catholic Academy in the United States and to a lesser extent in Europe, which is blessed with such enormous wealth, really make a significant contribution to institutions of higher learning in what we call the third world? 
The Holy See constantly urges Catholic universities to develop partnerships with institutions in the emerging nations. Collaborative projects among Catholic universities of various countries and different economic situations engaged in research together can help all those involved to grow in solidarity and mutual understanding. Collaboration is a concrete expression of educational solidarity and ecclesial communion. As such, it should be a distinguishing trait of the Catholic Academy. There is involved what Pope very frequently refers to as the exchange of gifts. That the exchange of gifts is an exchange which should touch the world of higher education in a particular way. There's also, in the uh, pleas of the Pope, a special place reserved, and it's going to be uh, kind of um, re-expressed uh, in the upcoming synod that has been announced once again for Africa. That the Holy See, almost alone among international uh, organizations, singles out Africa as the continent which needs the attention uh, and the compassion of the universal church. That enormous strides have been made in uh, Asia and in Latin America in, re in recent decades that have not been matched for Africa. The first synod you know, for the uh, uh, various continents was that held on Africa. And the next one is to be held, I think it's been called, for 2008. It seems to me that uh, the United States is singularly blessed to be in a position to lend its creative mind and its generous heart to deal in some ways with the enormous questions uh, about the integrity of Catholic education, particularly Catholic higher education in the continent of Africa which is increasingly menaced by an aggressive fundamentalism, uh, making it more and more difficult for Catholic institutions to survive. They need to be strong, and in order to be strong, they need some external support mechanisms, which um, I think it's probably uh, in the hands of Americans and Europeans to provide that. In the last 15 years, since the publication of Ex Cordia Ecclesiae, Catholic uh, institutions in this country, to a lesser extent in Europe, have certainly, I think, uh, come a long way to putting the Catholic character of their institutions uh, in the forefront of their concern. This was a concern that was already kind of begin, began to emerge in the 1970s, in the 80s. It was brought forward into the formulation of the, of, of the, of, of the new code of canon law and so on. In any case, Catholic is not just a label which can be tacked on to any particular or any specific uh, endeavor. The Catholic character of an institution must be visible it must be public, it must be embodied in the concrete expressions of an institution of higher learning daily life, namely in its faculty, in its curriculum, in the way it governs itself, in the way its students live, uh, and so on. Uh, the challenges are still many, but there is really no more thrilling or exhilarating, exhilarating undertaking for a Catholic institution of higher learning than to debate and, and debate in many ways constantly how can we become truly that which we have been called to be, a Catholic university in the service of the church. Thank you very much.
two stipulations. The first is, uh, if you could try to keep your questions short and avoid long declaratory statements or speeches. Uh, secondly, we would be delighted to hear from uh, students in particular. But um, we await your questions for the Archbishop. Yes. From your vantage point of looking at lots of colleges and universities, what would you say are some of the uh, best manifestations of this witness that you uh, speak of? What are some of the things that really strike you these days? I think uh, among the things that, that, that's, that, that strike me is the quality, frankly, of, uh, of student and or just the university life, uh, litur liturgical life or life of prayer. Uh, that's admittedly an external sort of just a, a visual, but uh, one notices when one visits different places whether this is a campus which, in fact, worships, that sees that the, you know that the final the final end to which we are directed is the worship of God, and 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 one sees that the other, you know, sort of more classical manifestations are sort of the vigor and the rigor of the curriculum. Does it take into account? Is it, a, is it a curriculum across the board which appreciates the Catholic intellectual tradition and, and tries to introduce the students in some way uh, to the wealth uh, of, that, of that tradition? Um, less important from, from my vantage point are, are, are you know, the number of uh, Nobel scholars and so on on faculties. Those other people take uh, and give due attention to those to those measures of, of whether a university is good or not, I, I, that's not my, uh, my particular concern. I'd, uh, but uh, what, what strikes often is, frankly, uh, the life of worship on a community. There's a blessed sacrament research. I mean, these are uh, not to be sort of uh, merely, not to be catechetical or, or school um, but that they, they point to, <laughs> to real truths about uh, uh, what we believe. You were next. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's say for, for a Catholic faculty member, right, that is trying to figure out, you know, whether a university will be true to its witness. I mean, what could be some of the marks besides, you know, worship? Because, I mean, sometimes I think that a professor may ask himself or herself, would I be better off at a secular university where I could bring, you know, my witness, mm -hmm. rather than in a place that maybe intellectually is really not Catholic and brings confusion to students and professors? Mm -hmm. uh, it, seems, it seems to me it would be the one, a, a, major, a major concern would be, what is... The, what is the what is the what is the, what is the curriculum like? What does the curriculum embody? You know, a curriculum is what it, where a faculty as a community best expresses itself. I mean, that's why they. I mean, faculties fight, and probably should fight a great deal about curriculum. And if one is in a situation where the curriculum, or one would find oneself in a situation where the curriculum is so devoid of any substantive. Uh, Catholic content, either sort of in a more narrow sense or even in a, in, in a broader sense, uh, where, which means that the community of scholars with which one uh, interacts uh, has manifested itself in that way is also lacking, then of course it's a fair question, you know, am I really teaching in, a, in an institution that is giving a collective witness or can I give my individual witness just as well and perhaps it might even be needed more at the state, state university down the block. I don't think a Catholic has any moral obligation to teach in a Catholic institution. I think a Catholic institution, when it's constituted as such, as a moral person, um, it has an obligation to see to its own continuance uh, according to the mission that it has uh, received and of which it is a steward. I want to move to some students first. Let me just... Um, you, people who look like students. <laughs> you, and there's somebody down here, right? Yes. And then you look less like a student, so then you. <laughs> He's got that all figured out, I think. <laughs> Could you give your opinion and advice about um, 
the new movement in the church for Catholic um, lay people to start starting schools, especially in the U.S. primary and secondary schools. Could you give your opinion about the future of that and how it relates to the church um, as a whole? <coughs> well, I, mean, I think it, I, I I personally think it's marvelous that Catholic lay people are founding not just primary and secondary schools, but even universities, and they're not and that they're not even doing this. Uh, just in the U.S., they're also doing it in 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 many other parts of the world. Uh, it's, it's, a funda it's a fundamental right of people to be able to establish organizations or institutions uh, to get other people uh, to join them in their endeavor. And if they want to be Catholic and officially recognized to seek the uh, the uh, the uh, you know to seek the permission of the bishop uh, to oversee it. Uh, If we're going to continue to have vigorous Catholic education at the primary and secondary level, uh, it's only going to be if lay people get together and do it. The number of religious is simply not there uh, to be able to carry this forward. I was very edified a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, a stu I was going to say a kid, a student that I talked to is now sort of in his 40s. Uh, <laughs> thinking ahead, you know, he has, he has three boys who are, you know, still in grade school. He lives in a place outside Dallas where there's no Catholic, um, there's no Catholic secondary school. He and his friends are starting to get together to talk about uh, founding a Catholic, educa uh, Catholic secondary school so that when their boys get to high school, there will be a place to send them. I mean, I think that's, I th things like that are, are enormously uh, inspiring and that it's not happening just in Dallas. It's happening in, in Atlanta and in many other places across the country. Why not? <laughs> You put a strong emphasis on, on, on faculty. I'm a young man. I feel like a, look like a student. You <laughs> <laughs> stuck in under the student rubric, but are not. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to become a, a lay theologian. Uh -huh. um, and I'm curious about the question of the mandatum and how, how does that relate to my being a lay person and to my lay apostolate? And should I be concerned about that for the future? Uh, the, man, the, the mandatum is simply a kind of uh, declaration or an acknowledgement, it's not even really a formal declaration, that you are teaching in, as, a, as a Catholic, that you are teaching in communion with the church. It's, it's um, you know, it's not an external uh, imposition because you want to be... I think from the very fact that you're that one is a Catholic and teaching Catholic theology, those both of those criteria have to be in place. That it's not unreasonable for those who are employing you, or for those who are coming to you, that if you're presenting yourself as a Catholic theologian, that you'd be doing so in communion with the Church. The sign of which, in a in the in the Catholic understanding, is the authority of the bishop. I mean that I think is that's something that is unique to Catholicism. The role, the uh, or if not unique, is is very strongly developed. The special responsibility that the bishop has for for seeing that the faith is authentically taught, and if someone under his pastoral care is self-presenting him or herself in that way, there should be an a simple acknowledgement by the, on the part of the bishop that you're doing what you say you're doing. Uh, I really, I think there was so much made about the mandatum in the United States. Not even in Canada did it get the same, did it, did it play the same way, or, or when, the, when the ordinances in Australia were being made. And they have just as lively traditions of academic freedom um, as exist in the United States. For some reason, there was a derailing of the discussion of ex corde Ecclesia into, admittedly, not an unimportant question, but hardly the central question. Um, because, in fact, it had already been taken up in the, in the 83 Code. I, I, th I think it should be something that one would want to do. I mean, it's an acknowledgement that if you're Catholic, teaching Catholic theology, presumably in a Catholic institution, that you're in communion with the bishop. I don't think it, you know, it shouldn't be either minimized, but it shouldn't be maximalized either. You know... Um, you had briefly discussed universities that may or may not be conforming with uh, 
uh, kind of like the Catholic ideals, um, specifically saying the two universities in Belgium. Um, oh, well, I, I, I didn't want to, I'd say that the, <laughs> no, no, no. It, that was all. That was all dealt with. It as a, I, that, that's that some put it that way. But, uh, <laughs> um, you speculated that um, the current Holy See would not uh, directly press the issue, but. The, I, I laid out the, the two hands. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, but you can see where the. Plan for the seminaries would seem to me to suggest something a little bit different. Do what do you mean? It would seem to suggest. Well, that you said they're, they're, you weren't sure about even though Yes. Whether whether at the at the at the at the, at the level of yes, I'm not sure of it. I mean, I think that there's reading Cardinal Ratzinger's writings. There seems to be some basis to think that that's that that's what he thinks about institutions. Now that he's not writing as an individual theologian speculating about what to be done, but as now that he's actually the successor of Peter and probably has other, all of a sudden, other things come up on his, you know, on his radar. I, I'm, I'm less sure to make a, 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 a guess. The, the apostolic visitation of seminaries, of course, certainly is endorsed and had to be, uh, the endorsement had to be repeated, was planned under John Paul II and in this country at the request of the American hierarchy. It was not, it was not an initiative of the Holy See. You were next. Many folks in the past have um, expressed a strong interest in Catholic studying the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. What do you think the chances are of the present Pope continuing that interest? Uh, the present Pope from his writings, certainly invokes St. Thomas, but he, his St. Augustine seems to be, in many ways, more his, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the theologian upon whom he draws most, even in his homilies, his homily of inauguration, so on, drawing on um, beautiful image of the shepherd and so on, was taken from a, a meditation on, on, on Augustine's homilies. Um, I don't know much more than what can be said for endorsing St. Thomas than what has already been said. You know, it's been said at the highest level in the conciliar documents, in, in, the, in, the, in the recent encyclical, in Fides et Ratio. I can't imagine that Benedict XVI would in any way soften those. I'm not sure that he will go out of his way in the future to continue to build on that. I, I don't know that, but... Because just because of his own background, you know, I mean, he's, his Augustinian bent is <laughs> strong. Um, you've addressed a lot about the faculty at the <coughs> universities. And I'm um, talking to some, somebody last year, somebody um, just kind of quipped that Notre Dame seems to be a place where there's a ton of Catholic students, um, but not very many Catholic faculty, which I think if you look at the statistics, 53% of our faculty are Catholic. And I think that tends to be a um, general trend among Catholic universities. Um, and I guess my question is, you look at um, places like here and other um, Catholic universities in which there's many students who are organizing and kind of participating in the new evangelization. You can see it in the rise of Eucharistic adoration and campus publications and things like that. Um, could you maybe just kind of address the role of students and how they can kind of help bring about this renewal and um, also at which point do you give up on a university? You talked about evangelical pruning versus just kind of um, waiting patiently and patiently. How long can one wait um, in certain situations? Maybe just to Right. Just to say something about the latter. How long can we wait? I, you know, I, I think that question to me is far more germane, for example, to the European context where universities have, some of them have, traditions of four or five hundred years and therefore that to think that if something has gone wrong in, 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 a, in, a, in a period of 20 or 30 years is, is very short in the, in the institutional expression of that institution and I think there's a natural reluctance to move forward to a very radical 
uh, for example, a declaration that simply X or Y is no longer Catholic. Because it, there's a sense of fidelity even to the, to the generations that have done it. And also that notion that I mentioned that some people do see this, that the, that the university is simply temporarily, uh, simply in the hands of the wrong people and that it's going to come back and it, you know of certain movements and therefore do not be too rash in making a judgment these are are are, are calls really of enormous prudence and how that's going to work i i don't know your other your remarks about the changing nature of the student body in uh, certainly those who are attending catholic and religious uh, or faith based institutions is is very true. I mean that the uh, the young Catholics, as are sort of young Baptists and uh, and others, seem to have an attachment to uh, certain form or religious expressions that the previous generation might not take uh, might not be taking so seriously or has not taken so seriously, and that's not just in this country. That's in many places around the world and is, I think, a, a cause uh, of uh, provided that it's uh, directed well and doesn't take an anti-intellectual bent or fundamentalist bent is an enormous richness for the church uh, that uh, we do learn often from the young, that they do bring uh, a, a freshness and um, uh, sort of stating the obvious that we have perhaps allowed to be, you know, overly in, in, encrusted with other with other concerns. If it's accompanied by, um, that wouldn't be certainly the case because the the student body here is too well too well prepared. But it it could, in certain instances, be perhaps accompanied by a, uh, a, an unwillingness to engage in rigorous intellectual work uh, a, and debate, and that would be. I think would undermine it. We have several students who appear like students up there. <laughs> start with this one who looks like a student. I, I am a student. <laughs> <laughs> You've spoken at length about an authentically Catholic curriculum. What is the role of non-Catholic faculty at a Catholic university? And is this necessary for maybe a different view of the world, not necessarily pluralistic, but to form a well, more round, more well-rounded student, more well-educated student. Well, uh, you, you've put a, you've put a lot into it, into the question. I th I certainly think that Catholic University have, has have always welcomed, you know, non-Catholic faculty members. I, there's 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 no indication that it, that it, that every Catholic that every member of a faculty should be Catholic. Um, and in fact, even the apostolic exhortation simply. It, it does refer that it that it's understood that it probably be that it should be a majority in most cases. Um, I think you know that the, that the the scholarship of of certain individuals who are not Catholic and so on certainly more than merits their being uh, taken into uh, uh, into a faculty, provided of course, and this is, would be in any institution that they fully embrace the Catholic mission. Of the university, that they are not just they don't just tolerate it, but they think that this is really something wonderful that Notre Dame does, and therefore they want to be part of an institution which has that they see that it has this uh, a fidelity to this particular uh, religious tradition, which they don't share, uh, but are are certainly willing to advance it and and put it forward, and and there are faculty like that and. I dare say, in, in every Catholic college university in the world. The only thing that would be intolerable, and uh, I think would be anyone, but this is common sense, anyone who's trying to undermine you or going against that which you believe in uh, probably should not be paid from, in, you know, from, from the funds that people are given to, to promote Catholic higher education. Uh, but, uh, yes. Um, you spoke earlier about there being some issues in Europe with uh, the Catholic institutions not staying within their tradition and uh, doing 
ceramic and research and such like that that perhaps contradicted with the Catholic tradition. I was wondering if you could comment uh, on the need of Catholic universities to stay up to date on their fields with research uh, versus staying strictly within their tradition and what role that might, me, and what role that might play uh, in Catholic universities being able to lead in fields like medicine. But I, I mean, I, th I think that there's all, there's all kinds of, I mean, that a, a, a Catholic should be totally up to date in his or her discipline. They should, they should be, you know, uh, pushing the envelope on research. When you're, when, you, when you're talking about questions of, of, of life, however, it seems to me it's not, particular, it's not groundbreaking to be engaging in the destruction of, of, of uh, you know, of the unborn, uh, even for what some people would regard as long-term medical benefits. I mean, I, it's, it's, there, are, there are moral uh, uh, and ethical concerns that, simp that come to play uh, that must guide the choices that researchers make. And um, I think that means that there, are, there is some kind of research that is, uh, should not be done by a Catholic and certainly should not be done under the, in, in, uh, under the auspices of an institution which, is, which claims to be Catholic, which only leads, I think, to, to confusion and to, to, to serious scandal. Many of those are in the area, frankly, nowadays of bio, bioethical questions, which are so, um, well, they're, they're just so much, so much at the heart of, heart of things. And all the more reason, I think, though, for a Catholic university, if it can, to have a, to have a medical school. <laughs> we could not, not to fly, not to uh, retreat from, from such questions, so that the few that exist deserve our support. Uh, it looks like, Let's go with the four questions that we have. Oh, the, well, five questions. <laughs> Keep them relatively short. I'm out of Particularly this. because we have three apparent students towards the back, one professor, and one dean. And we'll let the dean <laughs> go last. Uh, so first, uh, well, he's my boss. I say yes. I <laughs> Put him <them> on. <laughs> I think that it would be to talk by way of absence when you have, for example, you have a, a totally arid spiritual life, when you have a, you have a curriculum that, that never addresses any, any significant question in light of uh, Catholic teaching and, and Catholic faith, when you have a, a student life which is uh, basically pagan in its, in its, uh, in, in its orientation. You can find negative, you can find warning signs, uh, or a lot of them. I mean, you, any one sign is probably not enough, but you can, you can find them, and they have occurred it, it, in certain institutions. Even the same ones would be found in state institutions, which, which become decadent, which become morally, and in, morally decadent and intellectually corrupt. Um, but you spoke about both um, universities as witnesses, specifically um, corporate and collective witnesses. Could you just elaborate on that a bit? Witnesses like to who? Oh, I, I think I meant that uh, sort of as witnesses to the Catholic tradition, witnesses to the gospel, witnesses to the, um, to the integrity of the truth and the cause of truth and so on. I was thinking more to the wide, not not specifically to the student body, but uh, as a witness to the wider community. First of all, to the wider academic community, and then, then to the Catholic community and the civic community. Okay, I mean it probably also works, you know, to this to the students of the first one, certainly for a teacher, but it's wider witness than that. I had in mind. Yeah. In light of the constant discussion that occurs on universities regarding academic freedom, how much autonomy do you think? Departments of universities should be given to sponsor various events or host sponsor host events, especially those that are uh, antithetical or against Catholic teaching specifically. I, I, I I, I, those are obviously things that are of specific concern. I think, in general, though, that the, <laughs> I think, in general, to, to be sponsoring something that is antithetical. I don't see that there's that a, that a 
Catholic institution would, would want to see that it sponsors something antithetical to what it believes in. I don't think any institution would want to, uh, to say that something is debatable, but something that is antithetical, uh, where it's presented and it's not even presented in the form of a debate with the possibility to, I, I must admit, I find that sort of hard to, hard to imagine why an institution would, under its own ages, sponsor something that is talking about uh, or proposing values that itself doesn't, doesn't believe in. I mean, it's one thing that for things that are debatable. It's another thing when, you, when you're able to pre present both sides of an issue. But simply to give the form to someone who is... I don't. I really, personally, don't. I, I don't see how that. Why you would do that in a, in a Catholic institution or in any institution <laughs> would invite into its midst someone who is um, violently or is antithetically opposed to it. Well, perhaps we should have a question that's controversial and not something easy like this. One. <laughs> so I'll turn to our professor. Okay. Here. Uh, regarding uh, regarding the uh, Catholic University's relationship with the sciences. Um, <clears throat> this past summer, Cardinal Schoenberg. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know what I'm. Hearing I do. About the this. article in the New York Times and all that. Yeah. I, I'm interested in knowing if you have any uh, any opinion on that. Or if you have... Yeah. I, I tell you, I, w w one thing I can say is that everyone, sort of, it, it, it was big news in the United States, and it, they couldn't figure out in, you know, in Italy and so on why, why were they talking about this, and so uh, it, it seemed. Yes, and, and they, were, they, they were afraid that. But a close know. reading of his text shows that there would be no, there was no reason for them to be. I mean, that they didn't read Laura Goldstein or whatever quite closely enough. I, I think I think part of the problem was his, his use of the term neo Darwinism, which okay. has a very specific meaning to a biologist, mm -hmm. and, and and he was, I think he was more <coughs> arguing against materialism. Or, or right, he sure was. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure, and. and uh, I didn't. I don't know whether the, the, there was much of an echo after that those first couple of weeks here or not. Okay, thanks. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times that it was of greater interest to you that a Catholic university be truly Catholic than necessarily gray, and I understand that from your charge. Right. Uh, the question is: Does the Vatican have a strong interest in there being some great? Universities that are also truly Catholic, so Obviously. they have to be a strong Catholic voice. That, I mean, the, the stronger they are as a university, the more, in a sense, the more they can, they can. I think they can serve the purpose of evangelization. Yes. And the second part of the question is: there are many measures uh, people can agree upon, more or less, right. in terms of assessing the quality of the university, whether it be research funding or placements of graduate students, etc. <laughs> Independently of the specter of evangelical pruning, Notre Dame's very interested in measuring whether it's more Catholic now than it was yeah. three years ago, and how will it be more Catholic right. three years from now. And we use various measures. Uh, one uh, prominent measure, measure is the curriculum. You mentioned liturgical life, uh, which is very vibrant at Notre Dame, but not necessarily connected to the academic mission. It can be connected. It's not necessarily right. connected. Outreach is another one, service opportunities, scholarship. One uh, dimension that we track is Catholic hiring, the percentage of faculty members who are Catholic. Do you have any advice for I us think in, in trying to map out the different dimensions of Catholic identity, how to give different weighting to one or the other? I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't get into the weighting. I'd say that you probably do have to uh, distinguish between in the academic mission and, in a sense, in the, in the formation of the person. I mean, if you're looking for measures. Uh, I, I think one of the most wonderful debates the university can do, would you say, what are these measures? I mean, you're always going to fight about how they're to be weighted and so on. But to, because it, it does help figure out how deep uh, is our Catholicism, where is it, how is it expressed, uh, what's it like uh, to live uh, at Notre Dame? I don't know how you celebrate liturgical seasons, for example. I don't know whether I, if I went into the cafeteria on a Friday in Lent, whether I'd notice it was any different from any other day. I, I don't know those things. But there are, there, there are all kinds of measures that are appropriate often to different times and places and, and schools in different areas of the country. Uh, in a sense, that's your, 
that's your debate, but it's certainly what a wonderful thing to hear that you're already kind of trying to do it. Because it can be measured. Catholicity is not so mystical that there, 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 is, there aren't some measures from our, from our side that we can look to, you know. And, you know, the Lord will give us heaven, but we can do some other things. Thank you. Thank you. I have, first of all, uh, a little... until after you've received a gift here. First of all, I want to point out that this bag was not made at two universities in Belgium. Uh, <laughs> at the University of Notre Dame. And it has assorted items in it, like a Benedict oh, Institute cup. Oh, good. Uh, but mainly, we have a, a little gift here for you, from all of us. Oh, thank, thank you very much. And I hope it's good Notre Dame memorabilia that I could... For it, to show the pontiff. <laughs> <laughs> I have bookends already. Are these bookends? Oh no, this is lovely. This is this is complicated. Oh, this is, That's this is the stand. Complicated. That's the stand. But this is? This is a depiction of the place that people think is the Basilica. I see. No, <laughs> That's good. That's wonderful. Thank you. This is, this, is so, this is neat. Thank you. And thank you all very much. It was a lot of fun to be here.